Welcome back to Tarot Together. And as the compliment to the video on Arthur E. Waite, we now have the video on Pamela Coleman Smith. A fascinating artist. A fascinating woman. Earlier biographies for Pamela Coleman Smith say she was born in London to American parents. Later biographies research on her indicate that her father was a white American and her mother was a woman of color from Jamaica and indeed she spent time in Jamaica as a youngster and was very proud to claim it as part of her heritage. She spent time in Jamaica and England and in New York City growing up. A wide variety of life experiences. When she was only 15 years old, she began studying at the Pratt Institute in New York City. She took a particular interest in studying the art of Japan. It's so obvious in the work we see left from her. That art, it's full of clear and flowing lines, and it's never meant to be photographic. It's not meant to capture a realistic image, a reflection of the subject. It's meant to capture the emotions or the spirit behind that. Focus isn't on realistic detail. It's on the emotion of the art. She began her work, her career, as a costume designer and set designer kind of barely keeping herself afloat, not quite hitting a level of success, but living her art. And her art stayed consistent in that form that she'd taken on in her earlier studies. Some artists, when they view her work as a large collection, at least what we have that we can see, I've described her as a symbolist. Not surprising, the symbolist movement had so much in common with the art that she studied and loved so much at the Pratt. That was Japanese in origin. I have a description here of what the symbolist movement in art was. An artistic movement that suggested ideas through symbols and emphasized the meaning behind the art and the representation of art as a psychological truth, an exploration of the spiritual reality behind physical beauty. Her art was never about realism at any point in her career. Even when she did illustrations, she did it in the arts and crafts style or kind of an Art Nouveau style. She was capturing emotion. She never was capturing a thing. She was always relating to the non-physical behind the physical, even as she created beautiful art. In 1901, she established an artist's salon in London, where a lot of artists and literary folk gathered regularly. She was a vibrant, colorful, eccentric, woman, and she liked to adopt a mysterious and exotic demeanor. Along the lines of performance art, and she drew people to her upon the charm and the charisma of her personality. She loved to tell stories and engage in conversation and debate. And her studio was as much a salon for the gathering of like minds, as there ever was about an art studio, or selling art and making money. But there was a period that was a high point in her career. From 1890 to 1910, she was actually making good money, being true to herself, her wonderful, beautiful self. She collaborated with the poet W.B. Yeats 
on lots of projects, literary and theatrical. She illustrated sheet music, children's books, literary magazines. She wrote and illustrated books. She came to be known, which added to the draw to her salon. She came to be known for channeling, channeling drawings while well, in a trance listening to music. In a time before, we weren't hearing much about that kind of thing. They called it automatism then. They call it by other names now, but the idea is that she saw and smelt and felt music. And it came out of her and onto the art she was creating. She always said if she even tried to look at the art, the actual drawing, the act of drawing, she lost her disconnect and could no longer complete that piece. Why do I call this her high point? Because she was independent, she was financially successful, but she fell on harder times. And in fact, the rest of her life would be lumped into that category. In 1909, Waite paid her to illustrate his tarot. He'd actually already written the key to the tarot as a book, and he was ready for cards that supported that. The key to the tarot was not the pictorial key to the tarot. The pictures were added in for a second printing later after she'd drawn the deck. But that first creation, the work that she was paid to do, was in collaboration with him to design the deck that matched his key to the tarot. And she was paid very little for work that took six months, and for which it said she did 80 illustrations. But the illustrations weren't done once and done. Constant communication between her and wait, had her defending, challenging, fighting, and agreeing with him in turn. They had a lot of common ground between them. They had met as members of the Golden Dawn, but they also had a lot of differences in personality and experience and belief. There was a lot of back and forth. It wasn't a simple thing creating any one of those cards. In six months' time, she completed them. She was paid once, very little never received any royalties then or at any point in the future. In fact, she was so desperate to earn some money, maybe off all of that artwork, that she wrote to Alfred Stieglitz and asked him if he would consider buying at least some of those paintings from her. So why did Waite choose her? Like I said, they knew each other from the Golden Dawn. He'd known her about seven years at that time, so he'd known her through some of her experiences where she was at the forefront of her salon and active in the literary and artistic community. He felt her channeling abilities. He believed that's what she did when she created her artwork. He thought that would be a compliment to the cards, that something would come through her, that she may be divinely influenced in designing the cards. She personally was fascinated with magic, esoteric practices, the occult. She was a medium and a psychic. <laughs> Wait referred to her, I saw this in something I was reading, as abnormally psychic. You do wonder, for someone who had been studying esoteric practices his entire life, exactly how psychic would somebody be that he would consider to be abnormally psychic. And so, it was a job. It was a job that she did, putting her heart and her soul into it. Her influence on the colors, no matter the discussions between the two of them, the symbols. Although, of course, both being members of the Golden Dawn, they shared a lot of symbolic understanding. But the simplicity of the designs, they weren't meant to look realistic. They were meant to represent 
something behind the image. The art of the weight deck is Pamela Coleman Smith. For all that would not move and bend, I was so sure it was right in weight. There is that kind of wild, free-spirited essence of a woman who saw life as more fluid, more colorful, perhaps full of even more possibilities. What they both believed in, though, was tarot as an opportunity to explore that. She liked to present herself as a simple woman, and she was very fond telling stories about her time in Jamaica. But behind that facade was an extremely well-educated woman, not only of history and facts and figures, but of life experiences, well-reversed in history and mythology, music, and occult practices. She moved to Cornwall in 1918, and from the time that the deck came out, 1909, 1910, to that point, her circumstances were getting more and more challenging. She went out with the limelight, was no longer part of the wider artistic world. She fell heavily in debt, and very little is known about her until the time of her death in 1951. I'd like to read a paragraph as the ending to this video because her story to me is a beautiful one but it contains all those missing years. There's been talk of biographies for Pamela and I'm sure we will see some at some point. There's also been talk of a movie about her life and what a life it was. From her early years in America and Jamaica to the years after the death of her mother with her 15 years old and being raised by folks who were part of theater troops including Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, until her return to her father's household through the period of time when she experienced relative success as an illustrator and author and the running of her artistic and literary salon, to the months she spent creating the images for White and then her decline into obscurity. Mixed into all that would be her beautiful flamboyant personality, her making of her way in the world at a time women often would not even consider trying to make their own way, and her devotion to the suffragette movement, her power as a mystic, magician, and a storyteller. And here's what I hope. I know I'm not alone in this, those of us who have a lot of respect for this beautiful woman, that in those missing years at the end of her life, that she was living that simple life that she always enjoyed, perhaps with a loved one, with some biographers suggesting that loved one was her roommate for many years to whom she left her estate, Nora Lake. I'd like to imagine a peaceful time for all those missing years, one filled with beauty and art and music, for her absolutely music and love. Perhaps we'll learn more about her in time. But the essence of her artwork, the essence of her soul, lives on in what she created for very little money, very little acknowledgement on behalf of the Wait Tarot deck. Please feel free. To share additional information that you know about this woman in the comments below or on our Facebook group. And I hope that taking time before we settle down to work with the deck to explore these 
two very different personalities. A duality and a polarity of their own that came together to create this beautiful, inspirational piece of work. Has them worth your time to consider when you pick up your Rider weight deck. How about your weight Smith deck, as it's more commonly becoming named? You are aware, willing to be aware, of the personalities that informed it and created it. Mary Park.